We are paulomalley.com. Okay, great. And yeah, you got a few websites here. Okay. So sure. Uh, yeah. So um I'm gonna ask you some procedure questions as far as um you know sure. problems like you know, you mentioned sure. uh, removing wisdom teeth. So uh, yeah. do, do biomedic dentists do something different? You know, do they try to avoid the the, the wisdom teeth in traditional or pulling them when traditional uh, dentists would, you know, more readily pull them? Is there a different procedure that they use or do they pull them and they, you know, and, and that tends to be the same? Um, I... I mean, when you start go to extractions and things like that, you're outside of the field of biomimetic. You'd be more in the field of holistic or biological dentistry. Mm -hmm. So you'd look at what's the overall effect of this person's body, not just, oh, you have wisdom teeth, let's take them out. Um, you know, you have to look at, is there room for them to grow in? If they grow in, can they be taken care of? If they grow sideways, will they hurt the other good teeth? So there's there's an evaluation that takes place. Um, so it's not just um, robotic, you know, oh, you have wisdom teeth, go get them out. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. If there's room for the wisdom teeth to come in and grow without um, causing increased pressure and crowding, well, why not go for it? It's right. fine, you know? And then um, you mentioned root canals, you mentioned crowns. What about uh, you know the implants? Is that something that you wouldn't do in in that would be outside of the scope of biomedic dentistry, or is that something that you guys need to it's, do? It is outside of the scope of biomedic dentistry, but um, I'll make mention of a couple of things. It's basically um, as dentists, we should also wear our hat, so to speak, as dental engineers. So that means what materials are we using? Harder is not always better. So a lot of uh, dentists listening, they might disagree with me on this, uh, but zirconium uh, crowns, not implants, zirconium crowns are very popular now because they can be, they're so hard. I mean, it's really hard to chip or break one. So that solves a lot of problems in the dental practice because they don't have a tooth breaking here or there. The problem is, they wouldn't fall into the same pattern of being biomimetic because they're too hard. They're very hard on the uh, substructure of the tooth because of the shock value and also against the opposing tooth. So what's going to be the long-term effect? We don't have studies out on that yet. I'm just using common sense and thinking it could be harmful long-term. Number two, on an x-ray, you can't see through a zirconia crown. So there's, there's more natural porcelains that can be used where the x-ray sees through them. And we can see the substructure of the tooth. We can see if there's a problem or anything breaking down with the zirconium ones, you can't. So now if you put a zirconium one over a implant, it can be titanium implant or zirconium implant, you're gonna put a very, very hard structure over a dental implant. And it may over time, cause the breakdown of that implant. I don't know. There's not any studies out on that. I'm just uh, surmising, right? Maybe, maybe hypothesizing right now. It'd be better to use the other porcelains like uh, Emacs, for example. You, it's, it's a good, strong porcelain, uh, but they can chip uh, every now and then, but they more closely will mimic uh, mother nature, the hardness of enamel, for example. And on an x-ray, you can see through them. So they're, they're quite nice. Um, there's titanium implants and there's zirconia implants. The titanium implants have the metal in them. So from a holistic standpoint, people don't want metal in them with the whole advent of 5G. And is that going to set us up as sort of an antenna? And does it create weird uh, waves in the body? You know, I'm not an expert at that, but it's something to be, the, the person can think about if they want to be metal free, they go to zirconia. But the titanium actually has a, a give to it. It's like a it's like a small flex to it naturally. The jawbone has a slaw, a, a, a little bit of a flexation to it too. So the titanium would be a little bit more biomimetic than zirconium. But the zirconium is going to be more accepted in the holistic fields because it's metal free essentially. So. It's sort of a judgment call. So how do I judge it in my practice? 
So someone coming in that has great, big, huge jaws, a man that's super strong and clenching down and everything, we're probably going to see about titanium unless he has an objection to any type of metal in his mouth, because at least it's going to give a little bit. Because if you put the zirconia in, on occasion, they'll break the whole implant. So if they still don't want to have metal and they want to do zirconium, we said, well, the risk is you could break that. It's never happened in my hands, but it's in the literature. There's a chance you could break it. If you ex assume, uh, assume that responsibility, let's go for it. That's okay. you know. But at least they have informed consent on that. Titanium is a beautiful metal because it's extremely inert. And the old Clifford test, Walter Clifford, uh, the innovator of that test, um, out of um, uh, south of uh, Denver, I uh, forget the name of that city offhand. But anyway, uh, he's he's tested over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of patients on dental materials. It's a blood blood test, it was sort of an antigen antibody test against major different groups. So a person would get this nice booklet of all the different dental materials, and they would say S or NS, so suited or not suited to use that material. And um, the last time I looked at the whole database was about 10 years ago, but 80, I think it was 93% uh, of people were compatible with titanium on that blood test. And only 87% were compatible with zirconium. So I asked Walter, I said, why are some not compatible? Why are more or less compatible with the zirconium? And he said, well, it's because they use under arm deodorant, which has a, a zirconium type base in it. So they sensitize their body. So it's showing a sensitivity to that. I said, so in other words, it's not necessarily that it's going to be um, a systemic activity. He said, I doubt it would be systemic. It might be around the implant itself. You could see some uh, redness or you could see something, you know, so um that it's just a, a person has to do a little bit of their own research on it and investigation. But uh, personally, I'm good with the zirconia implants now. On my uh, free holistic dental course uh, um, lecture series, I talk about I favor titanium. That was about five years ago I released those. But now I'm moving more towards the zirconium because of the metal free and the 5G and the controversy around that. I, I, did I answer your question? You know, you, you obviously gave me a lot of, of your thinking on, on implants and I appreciate that. So you mentioned that your, your, um, your product for, for brushing, um, it doesn't contain fluoride. What, what, are you, what are your thoughts on fluoride? Should we be using fluoride? Well, there's great information in the, uh, International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. So you can go to, anybody can go uh, that's watching can go to IAOMT.org. IAOM is in Mary, T.org. And there's quite a bit of science on uh, fluoride. Fluoride basically being, it's essentially a poison. So it depends on what, where it's being manufactured, where you get it, how, how it goes in, uh, is it being ingested, et cetera. So for example, in uh, in 2004, I believe it was, the American Dental Association came out and made a statement. Uh, systemic fluoride has been found to have no value or benefit whatsoever uh, for the dentition of people. And you go, wow, okay, great. Now, what happened after that? Soon after that, uh, LA County, uh, many other counties and municipalities, they got the approval to put fluoride in the water. So uh, it's like hydrofluorosilicate. I don't know. It's sort of a waste product, apparently, that comes from the fertilizer companies and the Alcoa uh, aluminum companies, et cetera. And instead of them having to pay millions and millions to get rid of their waste, they, they sell it for millions and millions, and it gets put in the water supply. So those aren't good things, right? So even in uh, now, it's recommended that the a million parts, uh, let's see, uh, a million uh, parts per million, one part per million, excuse me, of fluoride in the water here in LA, they brought it down to, I think, uh, uh, half a million uh, parts, um, uh, 0.5 parts per million or something like that. So th they've lessened it instead of one part, one part per million. So what they discovered is 
that people were getting staining from the fluoride. They call it fluorosis. It's too much. So it takes it gets taken in systemically internally as the teeth are developing. So they they got zebra stripes, so kind of white and dark little lines, and sometimes crisscrosses, etc. Very hard to uh, bleach out and whiten out over time. But they weren't causing a greater uh, decrease in tooth decay as what they discovered. Now toothpaste has 300 parts per million of fluoride in it when when you get it. And there's always a little uh, warning sign. Uh, if, if one of your children swallows a tablespoon, they have to go get their stomach pumped because it can be very, very um, life-threatening. So uh, that's what we see uh, with that. In the water, it's one part per million to a half part per million. In toothpaste, it's 300 parts per million. Um, because because it, it, by the way, it does help with tooth decay, and here's how it does. It's essentially a pesticide, because remember, I said it's considered a poison, okay. so it sticks to the teeth. It does actually kind of stay around, sticks to the teeth, so it acts as a pesticide, so it, it keeps some of the bacteria from uh, lodging and getting around the thing. Um, but could we use something less toxic, please, to do the same effect? And we can. It, it appears that there's another type of... Um, sugar called xylitol and um xylitol acts sort of like a trojan horse um anybody that's ever watched roy and i mean uh, troy and they they send in the trojan horse and you know it it hides the warriors inside etc it sneaks them in there so xylitol tricks the bacteria that love uh that cause cavities certain strain uh, i won't go over it because um that's that's a whole uh Bio, biological study that will bypass for the moment, but but they basically love sugar. So when xylitol gets introduced, they're like, "Oh, hey guys, look, there's more sugar here," and um, they begin to gobble it up, and they try to digest it over and over. They can't quite digest it; they can't metabolize it, and they exhaust themselves and they die. So. It's known as a Trojan horse, basically, in dentistry, because we're introducing what they think is a sugar, but it's a sugar they can't digest, so they die. So it actually decreases those types of bacteria that can cause cavities. So, for example, in my toothpaste, and there's many more out there now, they have a, a high percentage of xylitol in them. And the studies are starting to come out showing it rivals those that have the um, pesticide fluoride in them. <laughs> I say that um, I, I I hope I don't um, you know frustrate any of the other dentists out there that are really really fond of the fluoride. But we've been pushed fluoride on us so heavily they try to stick it in every single dental product out there because it's a marketing gimmick. Oh, it's got fluoride in it, it must be better, and it's just not really it's not really the case. And there's better materials. The same way with um, mercury uh, fillings. There's better materials, stronger, et cetera. And the problem with mercury fillings, besides the mercury in it, is they flex at a violent, they flex and contract at a violent rate in comparison to the natural tooth. So the founder of modern dentistry, his name is G.V. Black, and he said he had parameters for putting a, a silver, quote unquote, silver mercury filling in. And they're real skinny, real small little cavities. You never did them big. Because even they knew back then, this is around the, uh, 1900 or so, they knew if you put the big ones in there, they're going to crack the teeth. Uh, better off putting gold in for those, right? But no, everybody started sticking them bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And we see teeth cracking all the time with them because of their flexation problem. So there's just better materials now. And it's the same way with fluoride. There, it, there appears to be better materials and by the way, if I can speak for just a moment on a diet when it comes to why are we using fluoride toothpaste in the first place is to help prevent people from getting cavities or people that get a lot of cavities to help them from coming back. Okay, so it's it's a good intention behind the whole thing, right? The problem with a lot of the people that are getting cavities is they're deficient in the fat-soluble um, vitamins, A, D, E, uh, vitamin K2 and um, calcium, uh, magnesium, and phosphorus. Some even say amino acid named arginine. So why are they deficient in it? Well, because of different fads, different diets, et cetera. Uh, and this is no 
this is nothing harsh against a vegan lifestyle or anything like that. You know, people have their different reasons for doing things, but the vegan lifestyle can deplete them in some of those vitamins. So they can be more prone to getting tooth decay. Also the vegan lifestyle, because they're not uh, eating uh, animal products, et cetera, they might be eating more uh, pastas and breads and refined um, uh, sugars and things like that, but it would still be considered vegan. So if, if you know, to, to maintain your teeth and prevent tooth decay, some of the best ways to do it is um, keep them clean, and brush them, floss them. Contrary to what you might hear on the internet, you don't need to floss your teeth. Uh, I haven't found that to be true. Um, in fact, we say only floss the teeth you want to keep. That's how much we believe in that one. So, uh, um, but but basically do those things, keep them clean, keep them healthy. And then if you can manage the diet and decrease uh, carbs, refined sugars, et cetera, at least to have them around a meal versus having them throughout the day. Not only is it healthy for your teeth long-term, but it appears to be very healthy um, for the body and preventing um, getting into what's called pre-diabetic, uh, being, being pre-diabetic um, and getting, and, and also leading more towards cardiovascular illness and things like that. So little did you know that we're saying, hey, do this to help preserve your teeth. But ultimately we're saying do this because it'll help you stay alive, not only longer, but also healthier with less cardiovascular incidents. Okay, so thank you. So sure. now there's a, um, there's two kinds of diets in, in this, you know, you, I'm sure you're familiar with the general frame of the real truth about health. And we have a lot of, there, there's vegan, which is a, yeah. a moral position. And it just means they don't eat animal products and and, and use animals. Right. They avoid it. And then there's whole food plant-based and they're not really the same thing. They can be, but they, they can be right. completely separate. So people who are eating a whole food plant-based were eating, you know, fruits and vegetables, minimally processed and not eating the sugars. They're not really eating, you know, a lot of breads, they're not eating, uh, you know, they're getting very, you know, a lot of nutrients. Um, yeah. I find that those people also have issues with uh, with the, the vitamin deficiencies that lead to uh, that lead to tooth decay. Or are you finding that it's specifically the, the vegans who are doing it not for health reasons and therefore their diet may be substandard, if, I, if you may? Well, um, you know. I think they're all, I mean, you know, that's the joy we have as humans. We can pick a, a diet and pick foods that we like to eat. And we have that availability on this planet at this time, which is pretty amazing. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't have enough patients that are on the strictly whole food side of the ledger, uh, minimally processed, et cetera, uh, to really uh, be able to give you any type of empirical data from my side, you know? Uh, I don't know if they would have a deficiency in any of those other types of fat soluble vitamins, et cetera. Uh, so that would be interesting for me to research and look at. But I will say that anybody anybody I've seen that generally has a high fruit diet, they have to be much more vigilant with keeping their dental care because they can throw the uh, environment can become much more acidic during the time while they're while they're eating those types of foods. Now, I had one that said, "Oh yeah, I have a high fruit diet. I eat one apple a day." I'm like, "Apple's great. It doesn't have that high glycemic effect. It's it's not like eating bananas all day long, for example." So, I think it probably just depends. You know, like that with that question, it sounds like being whole food. It sounds it sounds actually quite yummy to me, and sounds pretty good. So. It is, uh, you know, it is. Yeah. You, you enjoy it. So, okay, good. Um, and, and going back to the, the fluoride question, you're talking about like, you know, one part per million in, in the water and then three part, 300 parts per million in the toothpaste. Are there any um, systemic, you know, if you, if you eat a whole, you said a tablespoon of it, um, you, you have to go get your stomach pumped. Is there over time being exposed to the fluoride at that level? Is there is there any systemic problems that we should be concerned about? Well, I, I'll I'll actually defer that a little bit to the scientific articles that are on the IOMT.org. Um, but from what I understand, uh, they have shown um, uh, a decrease in developing children 
uh, that are on the systemic fluoride. Now, I haven't looked at that science, so please, anybody listening to this or watching this, I, I'm just directing you there because I don't know the accuracy of this. Uh, Dr. Robert Kennedy out of San Diego is a really top, top uh, researcher in that whole field and area. He's retired as a dentist now, but um, you'll see some of his writings on the IOMT. And also you see toxicologists and other healthcare specialists there. So it's a pretty good, um, you know, interwoven uh, group of people. It's not just a one-sided, one viewpoint thing. So their whole mantra is show me the science, which I, I love that. So uh, systemically, that's what we see. Um, there may be brittle bone syndrome. We see that happening in China. But they drink a lot of tea. The tea is from the water. The water has a lot of fluoride in it. And uh, as the women in particular are getting older, some of the men too, but they start hunching over and be bent over and and they have very, very brittle bones. So they, they've shown some skeletal finds of that uh, full body x-rays of the amount of osteoporosis that happens um, as a result of that. So uh, I think it's important for people uh, to try to minimize what fluoride they're getting. If they get a fluoride filter for their home, you'll, you'll find they're not easy to find, but uh, that, that just kind of, it's hard to eliminate fluoride now because it's going to be in canned vegetables to be anything that's rinsed off. Um, so, you know, it's tough. So um, just try to minimize it as much as you can on a dental aspect. I think I shared earlier, we get what's called fluorosis. So we can see when there's too much fluoride in the water, it creates that problem. And that's why the municipalities have cut back, I think to the uh, half, half part per million uh, because at one part per million, along with, toothpaste they were getting this they were getting these um too much fluorosis in the, in the water and you know some of the studies go back to the 1930s and 40s uh they basically some some uh village outside of um uh denver or something they showed people that were that were uh had very little tooth decay and they said oh well let's find out what it could be and they they saw that the water had a high concentration of fluoride in it and so that was the science and so, oh, it must be the fluoride. And, you know, so then uh, without further investigation, apparently it got into the, um, a little bit, the political hands of things. And, and boy, before you knew it, it's like, uh, the waste is getting dumped into the municipalities and, uh, it, it's just a sad shame, you know, and, and, and people go along with it because they don't really know, but, you know, there's, there's, there's interesting stories about fluoride, right? All the way back to, uh, is it that damaging or not, not damaging? What can we, uh, uh, what can a person expect from it? All the way back to uh, Nazi days in Germany, uh, some some interesting things about putting fluoride in the water there. I, I don't know. I I like conspiracy stuff, but I I like the science too. So I would say. Try to get fluoride filters in your homes and uh, keep as much of the fluoride out of your system as you can because it apparently has absolutely zero systemic benefit and it's considered um, a poison. So why, why ingest it? <laughs>